Hi, everyone. Can everyone hear me okay? Okay, cool. So uh, my name is Vinamrata Singhal. You can call me V for short if you have a hard time pronouncing that. And I'm a product manager on the uh, Chrome team um, at Google. And today I'm here to talk to you about building inclusive products for users everywhere. So before I was in the Chrome team, I was actually on a team called the Next Billion Users team uh, at Google, which is basically building uh, new Google products for emerging markets. And as part of that team, I worked on a product called Google Station. Um, and what Google Station is basically doing is we are working with local uh, internet service providers and systems integrators to bring public Wi-Fi to emerging markets. And as part of building this product, um, I learned a lot of lessons about what it takes to both build a product for users that are not you, but also take a product in one existing market and take it into a different market. And so I kind of want to share some of those lessons with you today. So my talk is kind of split into three different sections. So the first is, how can you be inclusive with localization? And I'll kind of define what localization means. The second is inclusion with understanding your users. And finally, inclusion with growth. And some of these are more kind of like best practices, tips that you should be doing, and others are kind of meta or theme points, depending upon the section of the talk. So I'll start off with inclusion with localization first. So when I say localization, what I mean is um, when you have a product and you take all of the different UI components or marketing components, like all the strings or the button labels and things like that um, in your product, especially if you're building a, a software product, um, basically translating that into a different language that the user is able to understand. Now, this seems pretty easy enough. Like, you just hire someone who speaks that language, give them all the text, and have them translate it. But there's actually quite a few things that are very tricky about this process. So the first thing that I learned is a lot of users will actually skim your UI in order to understand what is happening and won't actually read through uh, the, the page um, in order to understand the nuances. So it's really helpful to, uh, you know, kind of when you're, when you're thinking about structuring your text to actually uh, make it very skimmable. And I'll give an example um, from doing user research in India where I've spent a lot of time um, doing user research. And so in India, what's interesting is a lot of people like to keep their language defined faults is English, even though English is not their first language. And there's lots of reasons for why this is true. Um, some of it is because um, it's just the power of pre-defaults, like that's what the default setting comes in. The second is, you know, there's kind of social pressure to be really good at speaking in English. And if you are good at speaking in English, or if your friends see you reading or speaking in English, that's, that's viewed as like a higher social status. And so users, even though you know, we, we offer apps or uh, phones in, in their own native language, they choose to kind of have it in English. And so we kind of have to be cognizant of that fact and make our UI skimmable for those users, even if uh, you know, we're, we're offering these, uh, these localization uh, services as well. So skim making your UI and your text skimmable is, is pretty important. The next is slang. So you might have seen, like, and actually in the Chrome team, we're, we're kind of guilty of this. Um, whenever there's an error page, you might see, like, oh, snap. Um, so that, that you know, makes your product look really cool and it makes it seem very quirky and like you have a personality. But it can often just leave users kind of like who don't have the same understanding, like, what's going on. And, uh, it can, and it can actually create more confusion instead of actually helping them. So sometimes the use of slang is actually not very helpful and it's probably best to have a neutral tone. And then finally, visuals. I have personally found that visuals have been really, really helpful when you're thinking about designing a, a, a you know, designing your product or explaining a really complicated concept. And it kind of also helps with the skimming problem that I was talking about earlier that oftentimes people skim to really understand what's going on. So visuals can be uh, really helpful with that. And with visuals, something to keep in mind is make sure your visuals are kind of representative of your user base. Um, it can be really off-putting to users if you're using a visual of a person doing something, but the person who's doing the thing in your product doesn't look like them. So just something to uh, kind of keep in mind as you're, as you're designing your products. So the next thing I want to talk about is inclusion with understanding your users. And with this, my kind of main thesis is that make sure that when you are doing uh, user research, when you're going out talking to your users, trying to understand what they think about your product, that you're testing with a diverse set of users. And you're testing with a set of users that is actually um, representative of the end user base that you're trying to reach. Now, this sounds really trivial enough, but it's actually pretty complicated to do in practice. Um, so one thing that I found was very interesting is Oftentimes, when uh, we are doing testing, so when we, you know, we have an app or we have a website and we're just kind of uh, 
testing it to make sure everything works, that there's no bugs. We're often testing on devices that our users don't use. We test on our iPhones and our Pixels, but with really fast internet. But the reality is that, at least for the users I was working with in India, a lot of them don't have access, a lot of them don't use iPhones and Pixels. They use like Lenovo's or Acer's or um, other Samsung devices, or they're on like 3G or 4G, really spotty connections. So try to even understand, when I, when I, when I say understand your users, not just understanding who they are, but also what kinds of technologies they're using is also extremely helpful. I also want to give another example of how we saw this problem on Google Station. So just to give a little bit more context on Station, um, again, it's a product to bring public Wi-Fi to emerging markets. We originally started with train stations in India and providing Wi-Fi, free public Wi-Fi at train stations. And after we deployed the product, we actually did some user research to kind of see, you know, how is our product doing and uh, whether folks were having any issues. And we, what we found was really interesting was we, we found ourselves talking to a lot of men instead of women. And the reason for that was because uh, one, uh, less women tend to uh, go out in India just because of kind of societal and cultural expectations. And second, it's also kind of frowned upon to be able to talk to outsiders. Um, so kind of having that understanding and context, we did our best to kind of reach out to more women and try to get a more diverse uh, set of uh, women in our sample when we were doing our research. And what we found was their experience of using the Wi-Fi was very different from the way that men were using the Wi-Fi. And the reason was, as part of the Wi-Fi sign-on process, we ask for a user's phone number because it's legally required in India that you collect that information when a user is signing on. And uh, the women didn't feel safe giving their phone number because they have seen instances or things had happened to them when you know someone took their phone number and sent pornography to them or like used it to sexually harass them. And so they were like, you know, where's this number going? I don't feel very safe. And so having that knowledge and power, you know, we did a couple different things in our product to take that into account. We made sure that as people were signing on, we made it very clear that you know this product is safe for you. That you know this is exactly all the things we're going to do with your phone number, and made that kind of front and center within the product itself. We also you know edited our marketing uh, materials to showcase women using our service, as you can see from this poster here, in order to say like you know this service is ma also made for you, and we're doing our best possible um, to serve uh, our, our diverse audience. So the last thing I want to talk about is inclusion with growth. So this is kind of a more meta point, I guess. Uh, I feel like a lot of companies and products have you know, worldwide ambitions. And they're like, oh, I want to go to this market next. And oftentimes, when they're thinking about this, uh, they're like, oh, I want to go to China. They're often thinking about, like, oh, it's, you know, we, have to un un we have to follow these other different rules. We need to do more marketing. We need to translate our product. But I think the key thing when you're thinking about going to a different market or serving a different set of users is making sure that not only is there a, does a problem exist for those users that you're trying to solve, but also that the way that your product works and the way that it's trying to solve that problem fits within the mental model of how users think about that space. So this is a very like meta, hard to understand idea, so I'll try to give a concrete example to help explain this a little further. So on Google, again, using Google Station as an example. Um, so I was actually helping work on our first launch outside of India. Um, so as I mentioned before, we started at India at train stations, and then we expanded to smart cities. And then we decided you know, we wanted to go outside of India. So our first market outside of India we launched in was Indonesia. And you know, we could have taken the same exact product, launched it, d did our legal due diligence, do the marketing, do the translation, but that just wouldn't have been right because we actually spent two weeks doing foundational research in Indonesia, traveling to two different parts to understand how do users think of Wi-Fi? What are their expectations? What are the challenges that they have in onboarding to Wi-Fi today? And what we found was something super different compared to, uh, so there were definitely some similarities, but there were quite a few differences that we found when we were in Indonesia. First of all, users' expectations around Wi-Fi was very different. There was a much more emphasis on speed than there was on security, for example, which is not the same thing that we had found in India. And then second, 
what we found that users that in India were very comfortable with giving the phone number and verifying their phone number process, but users in Indonesia, that wasn't that straightforward to them. Because again, there was like a difference in the legal requirements in India, that's kind of for any service you access, you're kind of required to give your phone number. But in Indonesia, that's so, not so much the case. So users just have different mental models around authentication and around getting onto Wi-Fi. So if we had you know, just taken the product and launched it, it just wouldn't have worked for us. So for us, it was really important to make sure that not only were we solving a problem that existed, which is that access to good, you know, fast, free internet is hard, but also that the way that we were solving the problem fits into the model of how users, um, how users think about that space. So my kind of TLDR of this section is make sure you understand your users' mental models because they're not necessarily going to be the same in every market or for every type of user. Even in you know, India and Indonesia, which you know, are both in Asia, they still operate and think very differently. So I want to summarize with some key takeaways. So my first key takeaway from this talk, if you know, this was kind of a lot, so I just want to summarize it a little bit, is make sure you're building your UI for all. I kind of laid out some tips that we, I found kind of helpful um, in my time at Google about um, when you're thinking about localization and building a UI that works for all, um, specifically with regards to making sure your UI is skimmable, not using slang, and um, making sure you're using visuals. Second is make sure you're testing with a diverse and representative set of users. And then finally, making sure your product has kind of the same mental model in, in all markets. So thanks, everyone. Uh, if you have any questions, I'll take them now.